as teaching in real life. So they might feel a little bit weird or uncomfortable, or I know a lot of people don't like how they look on camera. And so it makes teaching online harder for them because they don't want to see themselves on a screen. Someone like that would be my mother who doesn't want to look at her face from a bad angle. So everyone here is probably relatively young. So all of you know these kinds of basics, but for example, and we're going to like repeat a lot of stuff throughout this, but for example, right now I'm facing a window. So I look, even though I just woke up and I have no makeup or nothing, I still look fine. Like I look nice. It doesn't mean you need to have like a full makeup and hair done. I have done nothing, but I still feel confident because I have great lighting. Now, if this class was done like this, it's terrible. You're facing away from the window. This is a mistake so many people make. I think it's really basic, but I'm telling you just in case because I see it all the time from very smart people. They put the light behind them. The light source should always be in front of you, not from this direction. This also is when you're shooting, it's very important. Anytime I'm shooting, like let's say you shoot a fun skit for your kids or like a video that they can watch when you're offline. Make sure you're facing the window, you're facing good lighting. Otherwise, it's just gonna make it so much worse. Do not have a window behind you. <laughs> this is the cardinal sin of video making. Another tip that I do in my retreats and when I do classes online is I make it a competition. So we're not gonna do that today because this is a super short class, but when you have students over a longer course of time, uh, you can have tiny competitions. So they can win you know, points and then the, the person who wins the most points gets something else at the end. They can win um, actual things. Like when I have big classes, the winner gets like literally a brand new camera that I get sponsored. So I know as a teacher, you could get something sponsored that the students might need like, you know, uh, even something small like access to a course, like an SAT prep course, or if you do a really good job, you get one free piano lesson, or you get one free whatever, or it can be something small like a sticker. You know, when you're a kid, you just want to win stickers. So you can have like funny prizes that are almost free. It doesn't matter. It just makes it fun and competitive <laughs> so that people enjoy it. So I, I make everything into a competition. Like if I say, your home so in my real classes i say your homework you need to write a script by tomorrow it's not just a script it's a script competition so whoever has the best script gets something whatever it is i make up a prize it doesn't matter what the prize is it just matters that they're competing against each other okay so let's touch on teaching live versus teaching pre-recorded which is more of a video is what i'm talking about when i say pre-recorded do any of you who are here right now have a situation in which you would want to do a video versus teaching live? You can just raise your hand or there's like a hand raising button you can press or you can put it in the chat. Yes, okay, so some of you would want to pre-record. Now, pre-recording or making a video also works when you are wanting to, um, yes, hand raised by David, I saw your chat. <laughs> Pre-recording or making a video also works if you have, you know, some kind of advertising you might want to do since some of you are independent teachers or maybe you want to do something to impress your higher ups and, and things like that where you're pitching a new idea. A video is a great way to do that. It makes you seem very professional and prepared. So teaching live versus pre-recorded. So live is obviously more interactive in general. It's easier to prepare because you can kind of wing it if something goes wrong and it's longer form so you can present a lot more in information a pre-recorded video should almost never be long because people are going to be bored and you're not engaging them so when you're making a pre-recorded video if possible only use it in situations where you're supplementing in class material so keep it concise short make it a fun video um, you can do you know something funny entertaining you can do a skit you can you know, wear a costume, something to keep people engaged, and you can control it. That's a benefit. You can control what happens. You can be editing out parts you didn't like. Whereas in class, you know, if, if this class was like a real video, I'd edit out like, oh, I don't know how to get people in the meeting, blah, 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 blah. You're cutting all of this out. So you can edit when you're doing pre-recorded, and it can be a lot more work. Pre-recorded videos are a ton of work, and that's something I want you to understand because, you know, when I make videos, a lot of people think it just looks easy, like you're just having fun and traveling and no, no, no. 
Anyone who comes to the retreats knows that making a good video can be very hard and time consuming, but there are some tips to make it simpler and easier for, for people who don't want to be spending, you know, hours a day on something like this. Okay. And I have the chat open, so if you need anything or if you are bored or anything, you can just comment there and say, you're not entertaining us enough, Aline. And I will look there. So how to make a successful live video. Okay, so I need to make the chat small because it's blocking everything. Here we go. Okay, so help the students relate to your subject. It's really important to keep things simple. Simple, 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 simple. Because, you know, as teachers, a lot of times we, we want to use big words, we want to be academic, we kind of complicate things. You know, I, I love using big words traditionally and I love, you know, I'm a, I'm a teacher's pet. So I love the SAT and I love vocabulary of the day. But for a lot of people, it can confuse them when we are making things too complicated. So try to really simplify everything you're presenting especially when you're teaching online. Simplify, simplify, simplify. Because people are not going to be paying attention all the time. They are going to just kind of fade away and look out the window and do what something else. And so it's really important that you get your main points across without too much fluff, okay? A lot of people asked how to make class more exciting because when I did the form, people were submitting their questions. So most people will be watching this class later. So a lot of people ask, how can we make class more interesting? So I actually have a lot of ideas for this. Once we go through the presentation, um, if one of you reminds me, I asked my Instagram following last night, a lot of whom are students, how can your teachers make it more interesting for you? And they had a lot of tips. So some of those are integrated into this, but I will read you straight from the horse's mouth at the end. So engaging is is the best thing you can do. So kind of like how I do with you guys, I say chat in the box, raise your hand. You can plan what works for your type of classroom. Um, it is much harder to have engagement online because of any technical difficulties. It's harder to call on students. But one thing I would do is what we used to do um, in elementary school is something like where you get a popsicle, bunch of popsicle sticks and you write each student's name for those of you in traditional classrooms with like less than 30 students and like if you're a university lecturer it's different if you have 300 kids but if you have a relatively small class you just write everyone's name on the sticks in the jar you pull it out and you say okay you know Jaira okay Rachel what do you think of this and that way they are like oh they're always paying attention because they never know whose name is next they're not volunteering to speak you are calling on them to speak. So they are always kind of in the back of their head aware that they need to be kind of paying attention. Um, so that's a really, good, a really good system that I plan on using on all of my online classes. Having students work in groups. So a lot of students suggested this. As a teacher, I understand it kind of sucks sometimes to have the students work in groups because then you don't know what's happening and they get sidetracked in their groups and they're just doing God knows what. But sometimes it can be a useful tool, especially if you have an assignment they're going to present at the end of class. So let's say you have a class of, um, Rachel, your friends, how big are their classrooms in general? You can type it or you can unmute it. There we go. Okay. Um, mine is between 20 and 30. Between 20 and 30, okay. That's like the typical, the typical class. Okay, great, great. So if you have between 20 and 30 kids, you can put them in groups of five, and then you say, okay, you need to present something about. What topic do you teach? Uh, I teach social studies, so I teach right now economics and events. Okay, so you can have them present, you know, about some issue you guys are discussing. Say you're gonna make a 60 second presentation. That's another technique that I personally love to use, especially online, is having a timer because, again, people can ramble when they're doing a presentation and everyone else is like, when are they going to stop? So I always use timers and people are usually off put at first, but then they start to love the timer because they know it's like, okay, you literally have 30 seconds or 60 seconds to present your topic and then we're going to the next person. And that way it keeps it kind of more interesting and engaging. Okay, how can we use, 
How can we engage the quiet, shy, or distracted students? This is another question we get a lot. And this is something I love that people are thinking about because, hi, Bubai, because, hold on, let me make this tinier so I can see the screen better. Um, guys, is this cut off for you, the top of the presentation? A little bit, we can see your tabs. Okay, I think I just fixed it, okay. You can see the tabs. Okay, so let me just make it bigger in that way. Oh no, it's not. The... So weird, it's like everything is, everything is not working today. That's okay, You'll, I'm sorry the tabs are distracting, but I'm not sure why. No, we, can, we can see it now, it was before the, the pieces were underneath no. the tabs, now they're not, you're good. Okay, great, 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 okay. I was like, ugh, yes, ugh. Okay, so engaging quiet and shy and distracted students is something that I love when teachers do because as a student, I was not quiet or shy, but I did notice the other kids that were, and I would always, you know, as a student, try to engage them. So you can also try to have, have um, your other students get to know them. So you can start with an icebreaker. You can have some kind of fun game for five minutes at the beginning of classes, especially with new students. Again, the popsicle stick method is good because you're not just letting the, the strong, excited kids participate. Everyone is equal. Everyone is subject to the popsicle stick, or you can make a piece of paper and point randomly. But the reason the popsicle stick is good is that once the stick is gone, you don't end up pulling the same name twice. Okay, so tell your own stories. So using stories is a good way to engage students because you're talking about yourself. They want to know who you are. They want to know about your life. They're interested. There's this barrier between teacher and students. So use an example of yourself. If you're teaching about a certain issue, you can say, you know, when, when I was a kid, I believed that, you know, you know, social issues. I, my friends thought that, you know, being gay was bad or something. And now it's, it's more accepted, but it was a different world back then and da da da. So they're going to get pulled into this story. They're going to like perk up a bit. And then you can ask the students, you can point out specifically at quiet students, and you can say, did you have any experiences with this? Or did you have a favorite this? You can just remember who they are by, by not remembering who they are. When you look at the list of names and you're like, who's this person? You can just make sure you're calling on them. Try to deliver your lesson through games. This is a great technique that a lot of, you know, all of our best teachers I'm sure have used and can be transferred online and via videos. It's a good way to make the shy students feel more relaxed because they're not in their own heads. When you're playing a game, you're thinking about the game. You're not thinking about yourself and your insecurities and how you feel uncomfortable in classroom settings or around other people. And of course, give them validation. Um, make sure you call on them, say they did a good job, say their name, even if they give a bad answer, uh, kind of reinforce that it's good that they tried and it's okay if you make mistakes and things like that. Okay. Oh. oh, sorry. Yeah, I muted someone. Uh, let me make sure everyone's muted. Mute. Mute. Okay, great. So, oh, sorry. We have a typo because my assistant helped make this last night in the middle of the night. So, how to help students be more attracted to your lessons? Group work, we already talked about. Making jokes, not being serious, and making it relatable. Another fun thing that my mom would always do and really works online is like do little costumes sometimes once in a while do a costume that has to do with what you're teaching um, something funny you know if you're teaching about history you can put like a historical hat just simple stuff even that you have around the house this will make the students like really more interested in, and staring at the screen um, this is a small thing but today I was like I don't have time to do a costume but I was like okay I'll put like a headband so it's yellow so it like draws more eye to the screen something even these little things can really help Okay, so when you're teaching online and shooting a video, there's a lot of options. You can teach using something like Zoom, you can teach on Skype, you can teach on Google Hangouts. That's kind of up to your institution if you're teaching at an actual school. In general, I don't think they're gonna let you like choose your platform, um, but I think that Zoom is the best one currently. I think it's your best option, but there are benefits to the other ones. And the thing with Zoom is that you can like break out into classrooms and things like that, which is nice. You can break into smaller groups. Whereas with Google Hangouts, that would be a little bit more complicated and with Skype. I'll send all of you these slides after, so I'm just kind of going through it quickly. 
So these are tips directly from Zoom. I just went and got their best tips from their website and they have a bunch of different articles that all of you can read. Um, they even have articles specifically for teachers, which could be interesting to you. And so this, 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 who here has used Zoom before for teaching? What do you guys use? You can put in the chat, chat box. Do you use Zoom? You've used Zoom. Do you use Google Hangouts? Zoom mostly? Okay, yeah. So you guys probably already know there's a whiteboard element where you can write on the whiteboard, you can share your documents, you can do all of these different things here. So I, I have already mentioned this, but I really think the best thing you can do is have the students present information and that will make it the most fun and exciting on video because you know you're gonna be switching between the chat windows. Okay, let me make this small again. How to make a successful pre-recorded video. Now we're going to talk about the types of videos I normally make, which is a video, not a class. So you need to have some kind of script. You need to know what you're going to talk about. I never shoot a video off the cuff. I don't just sit down and talk. You can do that. It will take more editing and you may not make your point quite clearly. So I always have a script. I just open my notes here and I write down, you know, my scripts in my phone and I write I'm doing a script about loneliness right now. So I write my script and I write, okay, I need a catchy beginning. I need a hook, just like an essay. There's something in this, in this world that's more dangerous than cigarettes, more harmful than drinking, and more likely to kill you than even X. I didn't decide what X is, but I will find something. So now it's supposed to make people intrigued. They're like, okay, what's more dangerous than cigarettes? What's more harmful than drinking? These are such bad things. What could it possibly be? So you have the hook. And then I'll go, it's something that right now is worse than ever. And there's still, oh my God, what is it? So I'm just gonna keep having all these little hooks. I'm not gonna tell people what it is for the whole beginning of the video because I want them to keep watching. So this is a technique that you can use when making videos for your students. Instead of going, hello everyone, today we're gonna talk about mental health. That's boring. Nobody wants to listen to mental health. Everybody knows the word mental health just makes your brain shut off. You're like, it's such a clinical sounding term, mental health, mental health, so boring. So instead you say, there's something that's more dangerous than cigarettes, <gasps> more dangerous than drinking, which all of you are illegally doing, and more blah, 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 blah. So you, you kind of are creating a different angle to present the information in the video, okay? And clearly this video is about mental health and it's about loneliness, so, I'm just not going to say right away this is about loneliness because people will not be as interested. Okay, we'll talk more about scripting later. Scripting is very important. But I just want to go over the basic steps that you all will need to do. You need to script first, then you need to shoot. When you're shooting, you could use your laptop, you could use your phone. If you're using your phone, it's obviously better if you're going to have multiple shots um, where you're having people act or you're having yourself in different locations. Your phone is completely fine, you don't need a camera unless you have a really bad phone. <laughs> but otherwise, your phone is fine. So then you need to edit the video, and I'll talk about some different editing programs later. And then, of course, uploading and deciding where you're going to share this. Is this going to be on YouTube? Is this going to be on Vimeo? Where, where are you putting this video? And the way you shoot will affect where you're putting it, if you're shooting vertical, if you're shooting horizontal. OK. Um, yes, somebody's asking what about the video editing software, which software is better? That is in another slide, so we'll just keep going. I'll go through these pretty quickly so that we can do more interactive. We're about halfway through. Okay, let me close the chat so I can see better. Do I need to script my video? Well, the truth is that's up to you. I have some creator friends who script and some who kind of are more off the cuff. But I would say the vast majority of successful creators script their videos, meaning that people who are watching, aka students, aka the people you're teaching, are more interested in a at least somewhat scripted video. It doesn't need to feel scripted, but having some kind of script makes your point more succinct. Okay? Um, make sure you're going straight to the point, you're having fun, you're making jokes, you need to think about making it interesting. Again, I want to reiterate, you can use your phone. You do not need a fancy camera. Just make sure your room is quiet. So right now, I turned off the air conditioner even for this simple class. It doesn't matter if the AC is on right now. It won't bother you guys. 
but I don't like having extra noise in the background, even just this white noise. When you're shooting a video, make sure you're not having friends in the in the back making noise. Make sure your TV, even some of you, when I unmute you, I hear all your noises in your background. It's very distracting. So make sure when you're shooting your own video that you're going to be uploading to YouTube for your students or to Instagram or Facebook or whatever, that there is not background noise. And every small noise, you will not realize how much noise there is in the world until you try to shoot a video. <laughs> and suddenly you're like, oh my gosh, like this bird is so loud. This car is honking, like, can the ambulance please not come to my neighborhood? Can everyone please stop getting sick? Like, it's just so much noise in the background. So try to find where every, now, now everyone's gonna be shooting in your houses. So you find the quiet area, or what my roommate does is when he's shooting, he says, can everyone please be quiet? I'm shooting for 35 minutes. I just need you to be quiet for 35 minutes. And then we all like, try to be quiet. But it's really hard because it's hard to not do anything for 35 minutes. So that's a huge thing is noise. I'm, ta I'm talking about stuff that seems simple, but everyone makes these mistakes. And I make a lot of videos with beginners and they all make the same mistakes. So make sure you check your audio. Another thing is sometimes there's gonna be noises in the background you don't realize. So I would do a test shot and then listen to the audio after you do your test shot. If you want to ruin your video, make sure you do these three things. You have bad lighting, so you're not facing a window, you're not facing, you have overhead lighting. You know, just moving five inches makes me have bad lighting. This sucks, this is terrible, this is disgusting. So make sure you have bad audio, make sure there's some fan noises in the background, your mom is watching her favorite show, and make sure that the camera is not stable, so whoever's shooting you for moving shots is shaking the phone. So unless you're using a tripod or like me, you taped your phone to the wall because I didn't have a tripod forever, so I just taped my phone places and filmed myself. Unless you're doing that, if someone's shooting you, you need to make sure they're holding the camera steady. A shaky shot is really annoying and terrible. So for those of you who have not done film classes in high school and stuff, when you're shooting, make sure your knees are bent so you're like really stable. You're like your own dolly. So it's it seems again like a small thing, but your camera really needs to be stable. Like if you're going like this, it's gonna shake. You're not gonna be smooth. It doesn't look like it's shaking, but there's micro shakes and the, 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 it will look bad and it will give everyone a headache. So make sure your knees are bent and you're just shooting slowly. If your friend is shooting for you, be like, hey friend, this is how you shoot. It needs to be smooth. When you follow me around the house, you know, as I'm doing this cooking video or this classroom video, make sure it's stable. You can use a tripod, you can have a friend hold the camera for you, or you can do my favorite technique, which is just sticking my phone on any counter with something behind it to stabilize it. Because <laughs> I'm a lazy filmmaker. <laughs> a lazy but effective filmmaker. Okay, editing, editing. Editing is the part that I think most people are overwhelmed by. So I'm gonna tell you the truth about editing, which is, it is overwhelming, but it is also easy. It is both at the same time. It is as hard as you make it. Mm, I have a link that I think still works for two free months of Skillshare. So that's down here. You can just write it down or I can send it after or something like that. Um, I think it still works. <laughs> Somebody says better to use Audacity software for noise filtering. Yeah, you can use software for noise filtering. I personally don't do that. That's a little bit more complicated than what most of you are gonna wanna do. I don't even use, you know, after 200 million views or whatever, I don't use noise filtering software. I just try to make sure the shot is quiet in the first place so that I don't have to do extra editing later. Okay, so the steps of editing, you can just kind of use this as a checklist if you're not sure what order to do stuff in. You import your footage to wherever you're editing, your phone or your computer. I prefer the computer because I can see everything on the timeline. You place it on the timeline. So you take your clips from the library and then you put them in the order you want them. You cut them. Make sure this is another beginner mistake a lot of people make. They cut the audio too far apart. So there's weird pauses everywhere that ruin the flow of the video. So let's say you're doing a video um, about you know, economics, and you're doing some kind of skit, and you have one person goes, that's so crazy. 
A big mistake people make is they don't cut right after the word crazy. That's so crazy. And then it pauses and it's like crazy. And then the person's still there unnecessarily for an extra half a second, but it totally makes the video weird now instead of great. So make sure you're cutting when you're cutting your clips, you're cutting close to the end of the audio, unless you are purposefully leaving a break for drama or something. So you're cutting your clips very close together. This is something nobody does intuitively, including myself. I had to be shown this. And I was like, oh. also you can cut out when you breathe in, you know, <laughs> this is unnecessary. Because a lot of times you're going to be having two types of videos. One is like this, where you're talking to the camera, you're like, hi, you know, my name is Rachel. Today I'm teaching you about theater and drama. And this is what we're going to do. So that's one type of video. And then you don't need to cut the breaths necessarily. Um, but when you're doing a voiceover, so who knows what a voiceover is? Raise your hand. I can see some of your cameras. So don't, don't know what a voice, some, some know, some don't know. So a voiceover is essentially when, let's say I'm doing a story about how I, I love to drink water. So a normal video is when I go, I love to drink water. And then I drink the water. A voiceover is when I'm just drinking water. And then later I record myself talking about drinking water. And I say, Aline loves to stay hydrated. But I put that on the timeline, but my face is not talking. Okay. So that's a voiceover. So once you've cut the clips, you can add transitions. Who, who knows what transitions are? Who's edited with transitions? I can see your hands. Not, not, no one knows what transitions are. Great. So transitions is essentially, you know, when you're watching a movie and then it fades in from the credits, that's a transition. The fading is a transition. So the way transitions work are different in every program. So for your program, you will just Google how to add a transition. It is usually very easy. For me in Final Cut, it is literally drag and drop. You just take a transition, which is a common transition everyone should use is crossfade. That's just when it fades from clip to clip. Fading in, fading out. Crossfade, fading in, fading out. This is a great way to make sure your video is not choppy. So if you do a video with no transitions, it will probably be very choppy. So you'll have clip, 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 and there's, it's just quite jarring. So just dragging and dropping a transition will make it a lot nicer. You can do really fancy transitions like turning a page, you know, you can do a transition that's like a zoom in. So you're zooming into the camera and then it goes into the next shot. You can get fancy, but a simple crossfade is a great first transition. Okay. Also in iMovie transitions is just a button. You just click it and then it will fade to the next shot. Add subtitles. I'm a huge proponent of subtitles in videos. Again, right now we're talking about videos, not live teaching, which is not my forte necessarily, but videos is my forte. So having subtitles is great for, you know, a myriad of reasons. Number one, not everyone can hear, but I think most of your students, you'll know if you have any hard of hearing people or not. Number two, people kind of pay more attention when there's subtitles because their eyes start reading. And number three, of course, in case anybody's ESL um, and they are not great with English, then they can see the subtitle and understand more easily. Subtitles, again, are drag and drop. Um, one tip with subtitles is to make sure they connect one to the other. So if you have continuous speech throughout, if there's not a lot of breaks, make sure you cut where your speech ends. So if you say, I went to the store, cut there, and then you say, and then I bought some apples, cut there, and make sure there's not space so the subtitles aren't appearing, disappearing, appearing, disappearing. It looks bad. Just make sure there's always subtitles so they're cut right next to each other, if that makes sense. That there's no space between the subtitles. If that doesn't make sense, just write in the chat that you are confused about what I'm talking about. Lainey, do you want transitions for subtitles? No, subtitles do not need transitions. But one way you can use subtitles to make your video much more interesting is if there's an important point, you change it from a subtitle to text on screen. So you could write, you know, if you're having a normal, like this would just be normal subtitles. But if I go, and then something crazy happened, I can write that in huge text. And then something crazy happened on the entire screen. So that makes people, again, you're more interested. That's a really good technique for videos. 
Background music is great, but unnecessary. If you want background music, again, the main mistake people make is their background music is louder than their audio. So you're teaching me something or telling a dialogue or showing some kind of interaction between people and the music, which is great to add, is too loud. So I am not focusing on what you're saying. I'm focusing on the fact that I'm annoyed that the music is so loud. <laughs> so make sure your music is quiet enough that you can hear the audio clearly, but loud enough that you can hear the music and you can play it to some friends to make to find what that, that balance is. I know how loud I am. I'm very loud. So I know when I'm putting music on, I put it at minus 10 decibels, depending on the song, just minus 10. Boop. I automatically intuitively know that is the volume my voice matches with music at. Um, and you will eventually know that too, because you'll, you'll kind of notice where you're always dropping the volume to. Here are some programs you can use to edit. I just tried to collect some of the most popular ones so that you even know what to look for. Again, I personally use Final Cut Pro. This is made for Macs. So usually if you're using Final Cut Pro, you have a Mac. Adobe Premiere is for all computer types, PC and Mac, um, but mostly people with PCs use it. Adobe and Final Cut, I believe, are the two most professional options. These are the ones that, I mean, even feature films are made on Final Cut. So they are also easy to use relatively. Does, has anybody here edited a video before? No, yes. What have you used to edit on? I use iMovie. iMovie, okay, iMovie's good. My movie's good. Okay, great. Uh, I use Adobe Premiere. Adobe Premiere. Okay. How do you find Adobe Premiere? Do you find it easy or hard? Uh, actually, it is very easy. We can easily cut and slice our videos, add subtitles. So I find it very easy and trusting. Okay, perfect. Great. Has anybody else actually edited before videos? Francesco, Scott, Collecting Smiles, Roberto? No? Okay. Hi, Roberto. <laughs> <laughs> didn't see you there. I didn't scroll down. Okay, so you that that's great. If you haven't edited, that's great. That that means this is perfect for you because it's I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. I hope it's not too simple, but sometimes people miss the basics and then they can't actually make anything good. So Adobe and Final Cut are free right now, I believe, because of the coronavirus. So they made it free. So normally Final Cut is $300 for lifetime license and Adobe, I believe is around $20 a month. So Adobe is great for just starting because you can just pay for a month and then see if you like it. Final Cut, there's not like, there's usually a 30 day trial, I think, but right now I think it's two months. So you can try both of those for free. Why not? You know, why not practice on the professional, the professional options. Filmora is also great and it's free. And iMovie of course comes on your Mac and is totally fine, but very simple. So you can't really do more complicated stuff on iMovie. Some phone editing apps. I did some research on the most popular ones. I personally cannot edit on my phone. I lose my mind. It's such a small screen and I'm just like doing stuff on my phone and I just wanna die. So I just import everything onto my computer because it's big screen I can drag and drop more easily. Um, but Magisto is a very popular one. So you can always try Magisto. You can try Videolicious and you can try Splice. I've actually tried splice but um i again i don't like simple simple editing programs actually are more complicated for me i find them more complicated because then you need to understand the specific app and how it works versus just understanding video editing in general saeed you sent me a message in the chat but i i think you were trying to send it to the group so you can just change it to um you can just in the drop down you can change it to everyone in the meeting and then everyone else will see it because it went just straight to me okay that is the basics of editing. If you have any questions, please send it to the chat and then I will, I will check there. Okay, specifically, this is a checklist I made for teachers. If you're teaching a class, what are the things you can, you know, take a screenshot, again, I'll send this later. These are the things that are really important that you have. Is the video stable? So right now we're all stable because we're all using probably our laptops. So there's no shakiness. But when you're shooting active videos, skits, whatever you want to do, you need to make sure you're stable and that the person is centered in the frame. <laughs> do you have clear audio? No radio, no TV, no cars, no fans, no one cooking in the background. 
If you added music, can you hear your voice? These are like a checklist. Just before every video I release, I do this checklist for myself. It's important. Is your voice easy to hear? Is the light good? How is your performance? Do you need to retake certain shots because you your performance was lackluster? You know? So just use this checklist as a way to know what you want and need to do. Okay. How to make videos more exciting. This is different than teaching in a classroom because you have much more control. So you can use funny pictures. You can use a meme. Everybody loves memes. Just find a meme about what you're talking about. Economics memes, um, photography memes. Francesco and Scott, what do you guys teach in general? You can either unmute yourself or you can write in the chat, whatever you prefer. Uh, I, work, I work in uh, real estate and also would teach people like mindful meditation. So doing uh, meditation videos and stuff like that. Okay, cool. That's great. Mindful meditation and real estate. What about you, Francesco? I'm going to unmute you. You're unmuted. Oh, wait, you're still muted for some reason. Maybe you muted yourself and I cannot unmute you. Unmute yourself. And then Uni, if you want to contribute, you can let us know what you teach as well. I'm I teach uh, how to train dogs. How to train dogs, that's cool. Wow, where do you live? Uh, Italy. Italy, that's a sick job, how to train dogs. Well, you don't need memes probably because you have dogs to distract people. <laughs> <laughs> and then Roberto. Hey. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you, what do you teach? Hey, photography. Photography, Phot very cool. Yeah, photography and well-being and happiness. And happiness, great, great. And then, and are you in, where are you right now, in Chile? Yes, yes, cool. in Iquique. Iquique, Iquique. Great, and then Uni, what do you teach? I think you're muted, so you will have to unmute yourself because I cannot control your mute. You, you have to click unmute first. I see you talking, but I, you must hit the unmute button on your own video. It'll have a little blue thing. If you put your mouse over your picture, you can click unmute and then I can, we can hear you. Once you figure it out, I will just talk and I'll know that you're unmuted. So everyone's teaching different things. Like if you're doing dog training, um, you probably don't need a meme to entertain everyone because you have the dog on the screen, right? But if you're a traditional teacher, definitely memes are a great way to keep students entertained. Emojis, so easy, just putting a big emoji on the screen. It takes almost zero effort from you. You can just type it as a subtitle, make it bigger, and then put it on your screen. So instead of typing the subtitle, you just put the emoji. You can just, um, you can Google on your computer how to do it. Mine is control, command, space. All the emojis pop up, I just drag and drop, and suddenly the screen is much more interesting. Songs and music, you can match the music to what you're talking about. So sometimes I'll use like the United States anthem and I'll put it on when I'm pretending that I'm fancy and like I'm a president, I'm presidential, things like that. You can do funny songs in the background that match everything. Yes, Jaira, you can take a picture. And also, like I said, um, I'll put the slides on, on the, I'll just email you guys all the slides so that you can just look through this because I know it can be like a lot to take in all at once. Okay, um, let me make this small again. Okay, so you can link your, your video to other YouTube videos on the same topic so that you can give them other ideas to look at. So you're teaching your students so you don't really care if they're looking at other people's stuff as well. So you can also put other videos as a reference point that might be even um, supplementing what you're talking about. And then talk about your subject like it's the most interesting thing ever because everybody knows when you're making a video, you've all watched a video about something you just don't care about because the presenter was so good. I once watched a 15 minute video about bass guitar. I don't know what bass guitar is or like bass guitars, but the presenter was so quirky and funny that I was like, wow, I just watched that whole video. So making sure your passion for your subject is showing. Now, now I just want to watch his videos on dog training. I just, I love dog training, even though I don't have a dog. <laughs> just want to see dogs getting trained. So cute. Okay. 
So on Instagram, I asked everyone last night for tips on how to make classes more enjoyable. And these were their tips. So giving practical examples is always a good one um, because then people can relate it to real life. A lot of times when we teach, we make it a bit too theoretical and people cannot connect it to themselves. So a practical example I could use while teaching is talking about how I got started and the way that I finally realized I could edit is that my uh, boyfriend's at the time, 18 year old sister was on a vacation with us and I was on my MacBook Pro and I wanted to make a video, but I felt really overwhelmed because I had never made a video before. My first video I made was about two, two years ago, two and a half years ago um, in my life. In school, I always skip the video projects. You know, your teachers give you an option. You can write an essay, you can do a video, you can do anything. I would choose anything except to make a video because I did not understand videos. So it shows how far you can come in just two years. So my, my boyfriend's 18 year old sister took the video I had shot just with my face with no editing and she started editing it. And I was like, I am smarter than this girl. If this girl can edit this video, then I can edit a video. And that was like my aha moment. And she's very smart. She goes to Stanford. It's not an insult on her, but I was just like, I know I'm smarter than you. So it kind of helped me realize I could do it. So each of you will have examples you can use in your classes that help your students kind of understand, you know, teaching piano or teaching real estate or whatever you're teaching. Or meditation. Most people really struggle with meditation. So giving example of, you know, maybe famous people who do meditation will help a lot of people be more comfortable doing it, especially because a lot of men are like, I'm not going to meditate. Like, that's lame. So if you show like, oh, uh, Mark Cuban meditates or whatever, they'll be like, oh, he has $4 billion. I want to meditate too. So giving <laughs> practical examples. <laughs> Casual conversations and socializing. We'll do that at the end of this class as well. It is quite hard to do casual conversations and socializing when you're on video because of the lag time. The way I have tended to do it, and again, I'm just sharing what I know. I'm not a professional. I'm just sharing what I've gotten from my experiences is I, I point at people. So you've already seen me doing it during class. I don't really let people randomly talk. Not that they can't, it just will be difficult. So I say, I try and imagine, you know, who might know about a certain topic. And then I say, what do you think about this? And then they can speak. So you make sure that they have a chance to kind of know who else is in the class. We've already talked about memes being straight to the point involving the students. Um, a lot of them are kind of reiterating what we already talked about, but these are straight from the student's mouth. Being friends with your students. So a lot of people mention this. I think they want, you know, your students are also lonely in, in a lot of ways. Um, I took a poll on Instagram the other day and it's thousands of people and half of them are lonely, right? So it seems unconnected to teaching, but people want to connect with you, whether it's via your video or via your class. So making sure you're trying to connect. And I do that in my Dear Lean videos by acknowledging people, right? So let's say I'm making a video. I will always try to list at least three countries where that thing is happening. So if I'm making a video about, I'm trying to think of an example. Even if it's a negative thing, it doesn't matter because it's relatable. So like in the beauty trap, I talked about countries that do a lot of plastic surgery. And I acknowledge three countries. I could have just said no specific countries, I purposefully said those countries to acknowledge the, the people who live there so they feel more invested in the video. And you can do that when you're teaching too. So when you're teaching, you know, for example, photography, you can say some great countries to photograph people are, you know, India, Papua New Guinea, and, you know, whatever. And then you name countries where people are receptive to being on camera. And now the viewers, if they're from those countries or if they've ever even been to those countries, they're more interested now. They're like, oh, he knows about me. He's talking about me. I'm special. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, some of the students were trying to convince us that you shouldn't give homework. So they said, don't give homework just because the classes are online. So that's up to you. But as usual, students are trying to avoid homework. Um, treats and prizes. We talked about that at the beginning of class. For those of you who missed it, having some kind of prize system really motivates people. And then having more graphics, even this presentation, you know, which I just made, uh, you know, in one, one day, one afternoon, one night, 
I, I, I try to have little images, you know, have, have images like this one I have here. Um, if you scroll up, I have little emojis, I have little icons, pictures. This makes it more visually interesting. You know, even if it just helps five or 10%, that's, you know, I'll take it. I'll take five or 10% performance improvement. Okay, where are you going to share your content? Okay, this is again about, we're talking about videos right now and not about when you're teaching live. This will clearly just depend on where your audience is most likely to be. So if you wanna send a video directly to just a few people, you can put an unlisted YouTube video. That's what I do. So this video that I'm recording, if I wanna send it to a friend afterwards, I'm gonna send them the unlisted YouTube link. Another thing you can do is put it in your Google Drive. You can just drag and drop it into your Google Drive. And then you can share that folder with people. I find that to be more complicated slightly. So I only use Google Drive when I'm sharing with one or two people. When I'm sharing with 5, 10, 20, 100, 500 people, I use the unlisted YouTube video. So for example, when I had um, Drew Binsky, who is a video creator, speak at one of my retreats, I had to record it because he was in a place with bad Wi-Fi, so we had to pre-record it. Then I just take the link and I share it to all the girls who are at the retreat. Everyone can watch it and they can comment and interact, um, but then it's not, it's not visible to everyone online right away. Okay, so let's say you are in a higher age group. Probably your audience is gonna be on Facebook. If you're in a super younger age group, they're more likely to be on Instagram, Snapchat, or TikTok, but TikTok is not really for longer form videos. So think about where your audience would naturally be and that's where you should be putting your content. So I, I take classes about how to run retreats from a woman online and she's in her 50s, I'm afraid to guess. I don't know how old she is, but she's a little bit older. <laughs> and so I know that her audience, she, she targets Facebook. So for me, I need to target Instagram and Facebook because I am kind of in the middle between the young, the young peoples and the older peoples. I'm 30, so I can relate to people in their 20s and late teens, and I can relate to people who are, who are about up to 15 years older than me. Okay, so that's, just, that's it for the actual presentation, but I have time left that I wanted to mostly spend just chatting with all of you, because each of you will have a unique situation, and each of you will have different questions and things you want to talk about. So I'm just going to change it to the view where I can see all of you. And I'm going to take off the presentation thingy and turn it back to normal video. And then we can kind of all chat with each other for a few minutes. Um, let's see, back to normal view, no more screen share. No more share, okay. Let's just go back to desktop and I will make all of you big. Okay. I guess you don't really need to see my desktop. Let's just get off. So all of you can, um, I guess you don't need to all unmute at once, but what we can do here is we can go through and each of you can kind of like talk about what you do for 30 seconds or so. And I'm trying to make it not you guys looking at the screen there. <laughs> but while I'm doing this, why don't we have you start Rachel and your roommate what do you guys teach? What are your techniques that you guys have used? And if you have any questions, you can ask me or you can just share your tips with everyone else. Hi, I'm Talia. I teach um, seniors, current events, and economics. And I've actually been on spring break the last two weeks, which is kind of hilarious. Um, but I'm we're going to be doing like a trial week of online learning next week to kind of familiarize our students with it and test some things out while like diving fully into it the week after. Um, but so I haven't made videos yet. I haven't like been in the online teaching zone. So this is good prep for me. But um, some of my friends who are teaching at other schools right now, um, a tool they've really liked is something called Loom which allows you to like show yourself at your Google Classroom if you're using Google Classroom and like show yourself navigating it. Um, and it's just like a really easy, simple tool that they've really loved um, to like mesh those two things. But yeah, that's all for me. That's cool. Awesome. 
future. So I am mostly looking for how to edit videos and make them enticing enough for two-year-olds to five-year-olds to sit and watch. But also feel free to interact and get away from a screen because it feels weird to force kids in front of a screen in these pages. <laughs> but yeah, yeah the help, editing help is really appreciated. Of course. And you said you teach preschool, right? Is that what you said? I teach them cooking and gardening. Okay. Yeah, so those are really um, fun videos to make. You know, cook, if you're pre-making the videos like you mentioned, you can do songs would be a great one for little kids, having some kind of song you make up. And then, of course, you can get like a tripod like this, which is relatively cheap. Um, and then you can put your phone here and then it, your phone will be facing down. And then you can do like your little cooking videos with a time lapse, which it'll just take a picture every 10 seconds or something. And then you can kind of, that's a very easy video to make, very low uh, experience needed. So you can take the free Skillshare classes, or I'm sure maybe there's tutorials on YouTube. I took a time lapse class on Skillshare. And that's great for like cooking and gardening is just you see it happening and then it's for it's good for little kids with like a song like that, that, that. so <laughs> that's something low entry level easy low barrier of entry like for a beginner to not get overwhelmed too fast <laughs> Rachel are you did you want to say anything about your teaching life um I'm currently trying to learn how to run a weekend long conference for a bunch of teenagers via zoom oh um, wow <laughs> So it's Friday night through Saturday night. I got one of the parents told me just not, to not bother with Sunday morning that she's not going to try and get her kids out of bed for Sunday morning. Um, it's okay. I am. I am not offended. I was actually very relieved. Uh, How many kids is this? Twenty-five. Ooh! Wow. What? Are, what is your plan? Uh, currently, I have three three main events and it's actually supposed to be a nature-based writing retreat which it was gonna happen in person and now it's not so now it's happening over zoom um so one of the things that i had to do was look up parks close to where they are that are open and to convince the parents that they do want to take their kids to the park for four hours so that they have time to go sit and write and then they have to come back and share what they've written but we're going to do it in breakout rooms and zoom's got breakout rooms so i think five kids plus an adult in breakout rooms is mostly what it's going to be. And then I was really interested in the um, icebreaker games that you can do via a computer. Yeah. I was having trouble. I, I can do camp games until the, until the cows come home, but I have never done them online. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So switching it to the online, that that's going to be very interesting with, I mean, what, what I do, and this is not really a game. Um, is I have people practice introducing themselves for 30 seconds ahead of time. So I say, okay, when we start tomorrow, um, we're gonna do, because I do more business classes, right? So for, not business, but business oriented. So for me, it's like, I call it a pitch competition. So I say, what's, you need to practice your elevator pitch. So what's your pitch? How do you pitch yourself? You have 30 seconds and that way, it's, it is kind of like an icebreaker. It's not as much of a game. Again, I don't like too much interaction because I don't want the delays of the internet to mess up the vibe, but you could have them do like, you know, uh, five questions or you can do two truths and a lie. You can do stuff like that where it'll be, you can also have, I've seen people use um, like, this is a painting of mine, but like, let's imagine this is a piece of paper. So they'll, you'll ask a question and then they all hold it up at the same time. That's like a fun icebreaker. And then you can say like, who has, you know, um, whose favorite, whatever is blah, blah. And then they can all hold it up and then they see who else favorite thing is blah, blah. It can be like a yes or no question, or it can be like a whiteboard thing where they write it down and they can interact with each other and see, you know, whatever you guys are talking about at the retreat. They can hold up their thing and all the screens can see it at the same time. Um, cool. And if anyone else, yeah, see, yes, Robbie held up his paper. <laughs> so do you want to tell us about what you're, you're doing, Robbie? Yes. Well, uh, I'm in Chile and I normally been 
on the road for a few years now. And since the lockdown, I back home. So this is my old room. <laughs> and uh, I've been writing, writing a book. So I'm focusing in, in a movie because I'm writing a movie too. But in the meantime, I want to prepare my motivational talks uh, by Zoom because I, I used to do the conference with big audience, but it's not lo longer a possibility. So I'm doing it online. So yeah. that's my challenge now. <laughs> yes, that is a challenge. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for telling us what you're up to. And, do you, and if you know me personally, so if you have any questions, you can always message me, but you can also ask me here. Yeah, so then, nice. Yeah, it's fun. This is fun. <laughs> Scott, what about you? What, how are you transitioning to the online world? Uh, not so good. No. Uh, it, I've always struggled with doing... Um, like mindful meditation and, and intuitive work online because there's something about the uh, being physically close. There's some just something there, and so I I don't know. I've been trying to work on this for oh my gosh, like years and years, and it never works out. Online, it never works out, or in real life, it never works out. Uh, online, on, online. I, I I don't know what happens. So. Okay. Well, I have a recommendation for you. Um, I mentioned earlier that I was taking an online class about how to run retreats online because I'm having my retreat online this time. Which again, for like for all of us, it's an adjustment because there is something about being in real life. It's completely different. But I did take a really great class from this, I don't know her full name, but it's called Wanderlust Entrepreneur. And the class is called Going Virtual, Going Virtual for Retreat Leaders, How to Take Your Retreats Online. This would probably be useful for teachers as well. Um, I, it's, it's a don pay by donation class, so you can pay whatever you want. You can probably even take it for free if you don't have any money. Um, I think I paid like, you know, 10 or $15 and, but you can pay more or less. And that class, the reason I'm mentioning it specifically to you is because one of the two main ladies, she does that. She does like mindful stuff online and like meditation online. And I think a lot of people feel like you like very like overwhelmed or they do energy work or Reiki and they're like, I can't do energy work through a computer. And she's, she's like, yes, you can. And she's giving, she's given, um, now the class is not about meditation. She just happens to use that as her example because that's what she does. But she talked about like even doing it, you know, stuff where you're touching a body or like you're putting hands for energy. She's like, just do it to yourself in front of the camera, if that makes sense, so they can see it. So I would suggest taking that class or, or maybe Googling Wanderlust Entrepreneur and looking, it's the lady Excellent. with curly hair. Yeah, so she okay. has her classes online and, you know, there was 600 people taking that class and um, a lot of them, I think, are practitioners of this stuff. So I took a women's circle online last week and women's circles are usually very personal experiences where you need to be there in person and everyone's like crying and super intense. But the way that it worked is she had the, for any of you who have been to women's circles or men's circles, you probably know what I'm talking about but they had like the flower mandala, you know, on the floor and she had the tarot cards around the flower mandala and she had everything in the frame of the camera. So even though we're not actually around the flower mandala, we see it on the screen and there's candles and it creates the vibe, right? So what I'm planning to do for, so R Rachel, this could be interesting to you also. When I do my online retreat next week, I'm going to have a bunch of plants behind me. So even though I'm in my bedroom, I'm going to make it look like Bali. And I'm going to have all my house plants and I'm going to drag them in my bedroom and I'm going to make it look like I'm on a vacation. Okay. So that's just like a visual thing that makes it like a fun vibe for everyone. Um, so for you, when you're doing your meditation stuff, try to have an exciting background. Like what you could do is, you know, I have scarves and stuff. 
like you can find some scarf or something you have and just put it on the wall behind you so that instead of seeing this, all they're gonna see is your head and this, right? And it changes the vibe. So having your background controlled can help change the vibe as well. So those are just some small suggestions from someone who does not teach meditation online, but from the other class. <laughs> Okay, who else, who else do we need? Saeed, are you here, Saeed? I know you're active. My, my name is Saad, you pronounce it wrong. Oh, sorry, Saad, oh, sorry, Sa Saeed is the last name. Saad is oh. the first name, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm basically a mathematics teacher and I've been teaching for like uh, three to four years. And when it comes to mathematics, it like, it's like my love, children are getting bored solving those heavy equations so it's a bit of a bit of a challenging job when you come to, when it comes to teaching mathematics so i find it really hard to teach it online as you know i live in pakistan and whole of the city is in a lockdown state so i find it very difficult teaching children regarding equations solving the problems uh, through zoom or skype so how old sort of are your students uh, how my students are basically of the age group of 15 to 17 years old. They are basically in their high schools. High school. Okay. Okay. At least they're a bit older. So they have a little bit more focus. I would, I would suggest, um, what, what type of math do you teach? Actually, I've been teaching like, uh, integration derivatives, pre-engineering mathematics. Okay. Uh, that relates much more to physics like stuff. Okay. Uh, so you can, you can, um, I'll just give some random tips. I don't know if they're helpful or not, just to kind of, even if they're bad tips, it'll make your brain start moving, right? But you can always have, um, try to think of real life examples, not, not real life, because probably you're not using this math in your daily life necessarily, but a job example where this situation would come up and be like, okay, start the lecture with like, if you're working at, you know, whatever tech company and you're doing this, this is where this would come in handy. And you, if you can solve this problem, then you're going to get paid more than all of your other engineers or whatever. So starting exactly. the class with like a real life situation, like they'll be like, oh yeah, I want to get paid more than the other people. So I need to do a better job and I need to know more. So just putting the end goal in people's mind at the beginning of classes exactly. really helps them pay attention. Um, that's something I do at all my retreats is the first day I'm like, what's your goal? What do you want to get out of this? And I make them say it out loud because then if they're getting bored or distracted, they're going to remember why they're doing it and why this information is important. You can also, of course, you can use the whiteboard feature on Zoom or you can just have a real, have you tried having a real whiteboard behind you instead of using the Zoom? Uh, I've been using whiteboard uh, for like two to three months. The real one handy. or the Zoom one? Uh, no, uh, I've, I've been using the real one. Like okay. YouTube lectures that teachers are teaching like equations. I've been trying to practice like that. Yeah. Yeah. For you, I would probably suggest using real life stories about why this stuff is important. And then of course, the thing we mentioned, like having interactions with the students, having funny math memes, stuff like that. Even if it's like yeah. talking about how hard math is, it shows that you uh... understand. You know, uh, humor, uh, uh, many people like uh, humor that would relate to mathematics joke. Exactly. Everyone loves math jokes because we, most people secretly like struggle with math. So when we hear jokes about how, about math, we really will engage mm -hmm. with those. I would use those. Try, think every class, you know, say I'm going to have at least one meme, one joke, one real life application. And then you have three touch points that make it more interesting. Exactly. Cool. So, thank Thanks for sharing. Okay, let's go down to... Our piano teacher, <laughs> Jaira, do you want to tell us how you're adapting to teaching online? Let's see. I think so. Everyone, there you go. Got it? Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, um, the classes for me have been great. The school made private groups in Facebook. So um, I have my students in a private group and I do a Facebook Live. And I, I really like it. You know, I'm sad that I can't see their faces, but uh, they are more engaged 
like this because they comment, they comment that they, I make questions and they comment, you know, they are in their 20s and they, they love that, you know, commenting. So Facebook Live you know videos. Classes. So it's Excuse not, one on, so it's not one on one piano teaching. It's one on. I teach English. Oh, you teach English. I don't know why I thought you, did someone else teach piano or did I just invent that? No, there's a guy. He's oh, there's there. a guy. I was like, for some reason I had placed you as the piano teacher in my brain. Okay. <laughs> that makes more sense. I was like, how does she teach piano to like 20 people at once? Okay. <laughs> okay. So you have them write their answers to the English things in the chat box and everything. Yeah. Wow. So, um, I like Zoom. I did it like two or three times and it's good because you can see their faces and it's like more fun but a facebook like i like it i like it and it's more interactive for me i don't know so you found so even though on facebook live you cannot see the videos of everyone you found it to be more interactive because of the chat feature yes yeah yeah so for those of you who can control where you're teaching facebook live is great like she said you just make a private group you invite the people who are supposed to watch your class or lecture and then it will be you live streaming and they're all watching now you cannot see their faces like right now we can see each other and on facebook live it's just going to be you but like she said it can sometimes be more interactive because of the liking and the comments it's much faster people are going to comment more when it's facebook live than zoom yeah go ahead and another thing is that the video stays there. Yeah. And in Zoom, you can see it again. Yeah, so on Zoom, you have to, you can keep the video on Zoom, like this video, I'm gonna record and save it. Oh, really? You can record, so there's just a button at the top. You know, it's, Zoom is very confusing to me. You, I, I'm, all the buttons are always moving. But at the top on Mac, it's different on PCs. I think it's on the bottom. There is a button where you can click record and you can either save it to the cloud, which is on Zoom, or ideally you would save it to your own computer because Zoom will only allow about four hours of filming and before you have to pay a higher amount. So you can record here. Now the difference is Facebook Live, you're also saving, as you mentioned, all of the interactions and comments. Those are gonna stay there. Whereas on Zoom, I don't think the chat is going to be saved as part of the video, just the video itself. So you can save on Zoom, but, oh, thanks. but Facebook Live is probably better for what you're doing anyway. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Um, uni, are, were you able to figure out how to unmute Uni? I still have you as muted and I am not allowed to unmute you. If you can unmute, we'd love to hear from you. But if you cannot, so just if you put your mouse over your video of your own face, usually the mute button will come up and then you can just unmute. We'll let you try to figure it out. Until then, Francesco, tell us more. <laughs> and then we'll go to Rachel and then David and then iPhone. There's someone called iPhone. I don't know who that is. <laughs> okay, you're unmuted now. What you wanna know? <laughs> How are you adjusting? Are you teaching other people how to train their dogs on video or are you creating videos about dog training that random people watch? Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I, I do. Uh, uh, can say uh, I, yeah, I can <laughs> see assholes. <laughs> um, I do video on uh, how to train dogs and, uh, uh, and teach uh, people in uh, with uh, uh, Zoom or Skype. Okay, so you're you're doing like more one-on-one -on -one lessons. This is my fantastic set. <laughs> it's actually very nice. It looks great. You have the yellow color. All the books is better than mine. You have like my closet behind me. <laughs> um. Yes, it's, uh, it's very difficult in this period and in this um, moment uh, to teach how to train dogs because we are in, nah, in the home. <laughs> we, we can uh, um, wow. we, we can make uh, nothing with, with dogs. 
Yeah. You have to explain all with the words and it's a very, very uh, complicated. Do you have a dog with you at home? I have two dogs. Two dogs. I mean, it is much harder in real life because a lot of dog training is about small movements, but you could always, yeah. you know, put the camera in a place that's larger, kind of like, let me see where, I don't know what you can see on mine. Okay, so like, let's say it was here, right? So you could always, you know, bring your dog here, you know, tilt it down so you see the dog more. And then you have your dog and then you're showing it with a dog. So that way it's easier than just you explaining. And then they, you can just say mirror what I'm doing, you know, mirror like the sit or mirror like the down, I'm here like, you could do something where it's more full body so that they're able to just mirror what you're doing. It's still, it's always going to be harder adjusting to a new format. But I think- yes, I have a place in, in the other side of the, of the camp. The other side of your quarantine <laughs> compound. Turning. <laughs> just turning the camp for, I, I broke the door. okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay you can see them oh nice <laughs> Nothing. Great. Okay. You have like a green screen essentially <laughs> yes <laughs> and this is this is the the room when i take the lessons uh yeah one of the things i i do is um, is uh, the, um, the let let's see no let's see um, let view what i do with my dogs and the uh, for, for explaining, I, yes, just, just this. Oh, that's great. That's perfect. That's awesome. I see your dog in the picture behind you, Rottweiler. <laughs> uh -huh. Cute. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing with us. That's very interesting, dog training online. And Rachel, I cannot that's see your face, but do you want to share with us what you're working on? Or David Wise, both of you could unmute, whoever unmutes first and tell us how you're adjusting. We'll do yeah, David. So, yeah, so uh, a, beach, like we had a week after the school closures to prep for online learning. And so the last couple of weeks, we've just been kind of go, uh, winging it as we go, which has yielded mixed results as at best. Um, thankfully now we've had a one week spring break. So we've been able to get a little bit of a breather and reflect on what's been working and what's not been working. Um, I think, but one thing our district is, um, at least on the high school level, we're not going to be doing live Zoom sessions. So I do appreciate that. I've been able to get more tips on like, you know, pre-recorded videos for my students um, because they're, because they're going to be babysitting and a lot of them are actually working in the fields around here. I live in a very agricultural area. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. And, and also I teach uh, English and English language development, which is formally called ESL, essentially. Okay, so you're doing ESL. So subtitles is really helpful, and keeping it simple oh, is great for absolutely. ESL. And Actually, that's another thing that's been really helpful is because you're not there to explain everything to the students, so keeping it as simple as possible, just like cutting back any sort of minutia that could confuse them is so important. Exactly. Like the word minutia would never be used in a lesson with ESL. <laughs> um, yeah, so when you're making these videos, is this like a video that's meant to reflect what you're teaching in class? Is it supposed to be like a one hour video? Or are you making small videos that are lesson based, if that makes sense? Like two minutes on this concept, two minutes on this concept. How have you done that? Um, Definitely more like conceptual overviews, uh, not quite an hour, but around like 20 to 30 minutes is kind of what we're aiming for. Uh, okay. So yeah, so more towards that kind of area. Okay, and are you putting subtitles on these? Um, not as of yet, because I haven't, um, for my ESL class, I haven't actually done a video lesson for them specifically yet, but I will be, yeah. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, I think that um, video-wise, that's great because people can re-watch it, which is really nice. They can re-watch the lesson. If they, is that why you guys decided to do it? So people can re-watch and they can watch when it works for their schedule? Pretty much, yeah, exactly. It's basically all these students have different schedules with 
all this craziness going on and they all have different situations. So we're focusing on like two days. Basically we're having two classes a week for each period and then they do it on their own time with the set deadline essentially. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting to see that you guys have been testing the different ways that work. Um, let's see. Rachel and Uni, if you guys want to unmute, feel free and just interrupt me. Oh, Rachel, you're unmuted. Yeah. Um, hi. I'm actually not a teacher. Well, I am a college. Uh, I've been taking up or I've graduated as a teacher, but I'm not actually teaching right now. I'm a call center agent. I just found out your video and door this zoom meeting and it finds i find it interesting that's why i wanted to join in i may i might use it in, in the future so that i would have it as a reference oh, that's definitely. why i joined it yeah where are you living right now kuala lumpur i'm in malaysia you're my neighbor <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's why and um i'm also actually planning to do some videos in the future I'm still thinking of how to do it and, you know, um, the tips and the tricks on how to do it. That's why I joined in so that I would get some tips from you. That's why. Oh, of course. Yeah, I hope it helped yeah. even a little. The thing yeah. with making videos is, um, I always say this to the girls at the retreats, is as many types of people as there are, that's as many types of videos that will succeed. Everyone yeah. can make a video and everyone can do it in their own style, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. And that's all. That's all for me. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. So I'm going to just, um, I don't know if you guys have any questions. I'm totally, like, even if it's specific to what you're doing or if you're just confused about something with video, now is a great time to ask. You can just unmute and just say I have a question. And uh, I think that I will, anything I know, I'm happy to tell you about shooting and shooting, editing, scripting, um, how to frame a video idea. Feel free to ask now. Otherwise, we will. Uh, hi, Aline. Hi. This is Saad. Uh, Aline, I wanted, to, I, I wanted to ask you, where did you edit your slide uh, that you delivered just earlier? Yes. Okay, so I nice. did my slides on an app called Canva, which. Can you spell it? Yes, actually, I will do a screen share and just show you the app. So it's called C A N V A. And oh, God, let's do Google Chrome screen share. And this app is my favorite app. It's essentially very useful. I mean, many of you have probably heard about it, hopefully, uh, for, for your own sake. It's essentially a really easy graphic design app. So design anything, you can type what you want. Like, let's say I want a YouTube thumbnail, then it will give me, I can make my YouTube icon, my channel art, my, and it will give me the right specifications, the right size. So I've, I've used this one before, for example. So it's literally like you can make a cool design in 60 seconds. So you can go to your own pictures that you have, so this is me and one of the girls at the retreat. And then now I have, in 10 seconds, I made a design. How to stay healthy this summer, okay? How to make videos like a pro, you know, ignore my typo. Now I download it, I'm done. I have a cool image. It took like 10 seconds. So you can also do this with all sorts of different things you can do. Um, presentations, you can do a media kit, you can do, you know, a presentation for school, you can do a PowerPoint. There's just a million options. So, okay, thank you. Canva.com, and, and it's free, it's completely free. So, you don't need to pay anything. So, okay. does anybody else website? Okay. have questions? Yeah, Canva.com. Totally okay. free. I love it. It's so fast and easy, and professional looking. And one more question, if you would like to answer. Sure. Uh, where do you, uh, where do you people edit your daily and weekly videos? I think they are far near to perfection. Oh, thank you. Wait, wait. What was the question? Who edits them? Uh, where do uh, no? In on which software do you edit them? Oh yeah. And I edit on Final Cut Pro. Final Cut also. Pro. 
Nas also, all of our team does Final Cut Pro. Project Nightfall, aka Aegon, used to edit on Adobe. So Adobe is just as good. Adobe is just as good as Final Cut. And if you don't have a Mac, it's going to be hard to edit on Final Cut. Adobe is equally good to Final Cut. Now, there are going to be some benefits that one has over the other, but for the types of videos all of us will be making, they're both perfectly, they're both professional grade software. Um, Filmora is Filmora. I, the best option that's free. One of the best, or DaVinci Resolve. Now, DaVinci Resolve is a editing software like Final Cut or Adobe Premiere. I believe it's free and it's very good, but it's also, I have heard, more complicated. So it's free, but then it's not going to be as user friendly, right? Just like when you're making a website, you know, you're paying for the ease of having an easy WordPress or Squarespace versus, you know, coding it yourself is free, but it's fucking complicated. So <laughs> you're paying for ease of use. <laughs> Did you have another question? No, no, I'm done. Thank you. Perfect. Of course, of course, of course. Anything else? Ask whatever you want to ask and I will try to help you. Well, what about hey. scripting? Sure. The... Yeah, so. Like how to script for, for a pre-shot video versus a, a live video or a pre-shot video? Either. Um... So I do both. So I'll tell you both. So for my Sunday stories on Instagram, which are essentially eight to 15 minute unedited videos that I upload without any cuts, I make a piece of paper that has all my talking points. And that way I know what I want to hit next. And I sometimes will even like draw a picture on a piece of paper Bye, David. David has to go. Thanks. Thanks for coming, David. Um, I will draw something on a piece of paper to make it more interesting. And I will try to use my personality and my quirkiness to keep it interesting for eight to 10 minutes. But I always have my bullet points. So I say, you know, five ways to be happier. And that way I know I stick to five instead of going off into the ether and just like blah, 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 talking about God knows what. And then what I do for actual videos with scripting is like a whole, I mean, I have a whole presentation I can probably email to you guys just about scripting, but I had kind of touched on it earlier, but scripting is like a whole beast of its own. Um, let me pull up my notes app. So I write most of my scripts in my notes app. Let's see. So I did a video, like a video I'm working on now is about a digital school. So kind of interestingly, because that's what we're kind of doing now. It's in Bangladesh. When I was in Bangladesh two months ago, um, there was an NGO that has a school that connects students in far areas from the city to high quality teachers in the capital. So I needed to make a video about this topic, which is kind of boring, to be honest, to a normal person. Like, Normal people on Facebook are not clicking on educational videos. They're clicking on like, this cat fell down the stairs and it was cute, you know? So it's hard to interest them in a digital school in a country they don't really even know where it is, right? So my introduction is about making it relatable. So I'll just read you the introduction because it's not a released video yet. So hi, my name is Aline and welcome to Dear Aline. I'm establishing who I am and what the show is. Where I grew up, so I'm talking about being a kid, it's already relatable, everybody's been a kid. I, when I grew up, going to school was easy. So now I'm talking about, they know I had an easy life of some sort, going to school was not a challenge. It was a five minute walk. So it shows it's close proximity. It shows I can walk, which means my neighborhood is safe, right? I'm teaching them stuff just in two sentences already. I had amazing teachers. That means I lived in a place where there is a good education system. Teachers are educated and also personable because I loved them. And I thought it was like that for everyone. So I'm showing, I believed my experience as a child was the same as everyone's experience, okay? 
And this is obviously a foreshadow, but it's not like that for everyone. So people will subconsciously be like, oh, it was like that for me, which means they relate to me, or it wasn't like that for me, which means they're still interested because they want to see what happens, right? So beginning of your videos is very important. It needs to be a hook of some sort. It needs to be relatable. I mentioned this earlier, but I'll reiterate. You should never start a video unless people are going to see that video specifically. You should not start it with like, today's video is about meditation, right? Because you're trying to get a new audience. Now, if I'm making a video for you guys, just for the 15 of you and I'm sending you a link, I can start it like that because I know you're going to watch the video no matter what because you're taking a class from me and you have to watch it. But if you're trying to get a new audience or really engage people, you need to have a hook. You need to give them a reason to watch your video, right? So this is my attempt at a hook. And each of you would probably be really good at writing hooks. We did, a, we did an exercise at the, the retreat, the digital retreat, um, where people had to write their own video hooks. And people wrote like crazy good hooks. So all of you have this ability to do it. One of them did something with like a knife. And I was like, wow, this is insane. Like she, I forgot what it was, but it was something like, imagine, there's a knife and da, da, da. And I was like, what is a knife? What kind of hook is this? So the next part of the video is, okay. And I thought it was like that for everyone. So I'm making it relatable. I have not mentioned Bangladesh. The second I say Bangladesh, people are going to be like, Ooh, I don't care about Bangladesh. Okay. But many kids are not so lucky. Less than 50% of kids who start school will graduate from high school. So now I'm using a statistic. When you use a statistic, you're helping to prove your authority. So people might think, what does this lady know? Why should I listen to her? Well, now I'm using a statistic. So now I'm using a real life example, right? This is a fact. I'm presenting a fact. And it's a shocking fact. To someone from the US, it's shocking that less than half of kids will graduate because like everyone graduates in the US, like that I know my friends all graduate. So, and then I go, but why? So I'm asking a question. You know, this is, we've all learned this in school. Asking a question helps people, a rhetorical question that you're going to answer yourself. But why? In most of the world, families worry about money, health, and even food. So my audience is very international. So I have to appeal to Americans who are used to a nice lifestyle. And I have to appeal to developing countries who are, used to Americans acting like everyone um, should know everything about America. So I need to appeal to both of these audiences. So I'm teaching the Americans about the rest of the world. And as for people watching from the developing countries, they currently feel acknowledged because I'm acknowledging that they struggled with the simple things in life, money, food, health, right? Kids will have to go to work to help their families. Girls get married young, or they're simply too hungry to go to school. So right now I'm educating, these are facts, and I'm shocking. So you're using the shock factor and you're teaching people, right? So when you're scripting, things to keep in mind are using facts. So if you're teaching about meditation, most people, um, unless you're from a, a country where meditation is kind of normal, like India maybe, or from Los Angeles, like me, then, most people think meditation is like hokey. They're like, what is this? This is fake news. Like this isn't going to do anything. So for you, you can use studies. You can use cool information. You can use, like I mentioned earlier, famous people who do meditation. And don't just say, you know, Mark Cuban does meditation because then they're not going to believe you because it's not very specific. But you could say, you know, Steve Jobs once said blah, blah, blah. Or... I don't know who meditates, but lots of famous people these days. So you're going to be using these examples. And why, why use a famous person? Because it's relatable to everyone. And they see them as successful and people subconsciously, many people want to be successful or emulate those lifestyles. So when you're writing a script, you need to have a hook at the beginning. You need to have a hook at the end, which is where a lot of people mess up. The last line of your video for the few people who will watch your video to the end, because people do not have a high retention rate, the people who watch until the end, you need to have a last line that will make them share the video. Now, what will not make them share the video is saying, share this video. Okay, 
that might make a few people do it, but in general, you want to provide value so that they want to share it on their own. So a technique I often use is, again, trying to make it relatable. So I go, the ending line for this video is something like, this is, this is a lesson we could all learn from, right? So what I'm subconsciously sharing is this message is important for everyone to hear, which will subconsciously make people want to share the video. Because I'm saying this is a lesson we could all learn, aka share it with all your friends, right? So you need to give people a call to action at the end of the video. Or you could do something like, um, now you can try meditation, like, you know, sit for five seconds. I, I don't know how to meditate. So I don't know what you would say exactly. You're the professional, but you will say something and you'll be like, you know, touch your head and your heart or whatever, or do whatever and give them an action and, and then see, see what difference it will make. You know, you have some kind of dramatic ending. So in a script, you have a hook, you have a personal experience, you have a statistic or fact or more than one to back up what you're talking about. You have um, educational value, you have relatability, and then you have your outro, your, sh your call to action. So these are kind of the building blocks of a video. You can fill in the rest. But again, as we have said over and over, make sure you're cutting out the crap. Don't have too much information. Okay. So scripting is hard and you're just gonna get better by doing it over and over and over and over and over until you want to die from scripting. So <laughs> like that's the best advice. If you look at my phone, like a lot of these are scripts, right? It's just endless. Like it's just forever. It goes forever. Okay, does anybody else have a specific question that I can answer while I'm here? about video making or content creating or whatever is confusing to you. I'm still stuck on games. Do you guys have any, does anybody else in the, in the chat or um, anybody else have games? I have House Party and Kahool are the ones that I wrote down from here. Um, and then the elevator speech that you had and then the one that you were talking about, the game that I've played is called All My Friends and Neighbors where you like run across the circle when you have something in common and this one they just hold up a paper. Yeah, that would be like, exactly, like that's the copy of that game to see who it is. Does anybody else have icebreaker games to recommend for the online? I'm trying to find an app. My friend told me about an app, but it might've been House Party where you can play House games party. with people. Could, yeah, could you do like, heads up? Oh, we could do that. We could do heads up. You could do the mustache game. Been... You know, 20 seconds. <laughs> like you make, I, I call it that because the version I have is in a box and they're all mustaches, but you put on a mustache and it'll say like, you know, you've played this. It'll say David Beckham. And then people, you have to ask questions that are, have yes or no answers. Like, is it dead or alive? And they're like, alive. Is it? A person from America, and they're like, no, from Europe, yes. And then they have to guess who the person is on their mustache um, or on their forehead, you know, whatever. So that's cool. the game. If anyone else has ideas, you can just pop in. I'm trying to think of what else could be a nice icebreaker. I haven't thought about icebreakers on video very much. Icebreakers and videos, I'm working with 13 to 15 year olds. So games, things like, I play human knot all the time. You have to hold hands and be close to each other. It's not gonna work. Yeah, it's uh, not gonna work. Would this uh, be an online interactive uh, teaching? So it's an online, it's an online weekend retreat that's a writing retreat for 13 to 15 year olds. Cool. And I have breakout groups and they asked, the last time I ran one of these, they asked to have a game in each breakout group. So now I'm looking for online versions of games that can play. Because I have a zillion that we could play in person, but I yeah, just- Yeah, I mean, is it gonna be an interactive, like a video setting? Yes. With a video setting? Yes. Well, you can actually do two truths, two truths and a lie. In a way, you would also be, um, knowing them or engaging them in that activity and at the same time getting a deeper level or knowing them personally. 
or you could actually um, ask questions like, because uh, this has been an icebreaker for us, um, tell us something unique about yourself, something that no one knows, and it's going to be like a game, and sometimes it's going to be funny, it would turn out to be a funny thing, you know. Like for me, um, they would they would be surprised if I tell them that I'm scared of pulling hairs, and they would be like, "What?" And they would all be reacting to it, something like that. And it would be a good icebreaker as well. And at the same time, you would get to know them on a deeper level, on a personal level, something like that. Yeah, but two two, two truths and a lie that would be a good one. They would you would um uh, what the what's the, the what would happen is they would write two truths and a lie, and then everyone would be guessing what is the lie on those three things, those three uh, sentences that they wrote. Yeah. yeah. It would be a good idea as well. I know the game. It's a favorite of dating apps. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Hi, Thank Scott. You. Scott's heading out. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. That's a good idea, two truths and a lie. <laughs> And also, of course, the classic, you know, clean version of uh, ten, 10 fingers, you know, who has, you know, who speaks more than three languages? Because then you can see everyone on the screen and you see whose hand goes down. Who has... Yeah, that's a thing in TikTok as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're stealing our 90s games. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> 10 fingers, two truths and a lie, anything where you're holding up cards with words on it, you know, or papers with words. Um, you could do like, uh, stuff, competitions like that, things like that, depending on what they're interested in. Okay. Any last one or two questions before we all head out? It's been a long class, so I know everyone's probably tired. Anything you need to know? Okay. Okay, everyone. Well, thanks for coming in and I hope it was at least somewhat useful and helpful and, uh, it was fun um, talking with everyone. Uh, uh, Aline, where will you provide those slides? That yes, you I will earlier? send them in an email. So are you on the, e did you get the original email? Uh, that I sent up on the class? Uh, no. You didn't. So shoot me your email right now in the group chat and then I'll add you to the email list and then I'll send the slides to the whole email list. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, so shoot it over right now so I don't lose it. Anyone else who's not on the email list and if you need the slides, just shoot me your email. Here it is, Uptown Girl, Saeed, or Saud, Saad, Saad. Let's copy and paste these so I don't lose them. And then here's Rachel Gamos. Okay. Uptown girl, Jaira. Okay, let's add it here. Okay, Francesco. Okay, great, great, great. Awesome. Great. Thanks, everyone. I'll send these out later today, maybe tonight. Um,